So high-functioning autism, or ASD level one, is a developmental disorder. And what that means is developmentally, your partner or spouse on the autism spectrum has a social emotional brain that is underdeveloped relative to his logical brain. So you, if you are an NT wife, neurotypical, you no doubt are very high in social intelligence, very high in emotional intelligence. Your partner on the spectrum is low in both of those areas. And to make matters even slightly more complicated, the autistic brain is overly logical. So we have the underdeveloped social emotional brain and the overly developed logical brain. Now, why could that cause a problem? You wouldn't think that having too much logic could possibly be an issue. It's like, how can you eat too many vegetables? But if you have an overly logical brain, you get stuck in analysis all the time. You get, you get stuck in the planning phase. You get stuck hooked on one little detail and you can't move forward with implementation. It's hard to get from thought to action. You may have experience with your husband who has high functioning autism that, for example, if you're planning a vacation, he plans and plans and plans and plans and gets stuck on a, just two or three details and he can't see the big picture. And then you have to be the one to actually implement the plan. So with the overly logical brain, you get stuck on a thought and it's hard to move forward with action. You've heard of the phrase, ready, aim, fire, right? So with the overlogical brain, it's like ready, aim, 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 and you never get to the fire part. So if I have an overly logical brain and I am planning a project, for example, initially I am the thinker in charge of the thoughts, but when overanalysis kicks in, now, the thoughts are in charge of the thinker. And I involuntarily get sucked into rumination. And therefore my thought stream kind of goes in circles. The high functioning autistic brain is an overthinking brain. And overthinkers believe they're helping themselves by rehashing their problems in their heads or going over all the details with respect to what might go wrong. The overly logical brain will also overthink when, with respect to relationships. For example, the autistic partner might be thinking along the lines of, I don't think I'm capable of meeting her wants or needs. I doubt that I'll ever understand how she feels. I'm starting to doubt our long-term compatibility. And also, I read a lot of extra things into her words and actions. In other words, I just assume, rather than verifying why she is saying or doing what she is, and I will tend to put a negative spin on her behavior. So in counseling with couples, I have uh, heard neurotypical wives refer to their Asperger's husband as a robot or Mr. Spock or sometimes even a hologram. And the reason they re use some of these terms is because they say he just lives in his head and you never really hear anything coming from the heart. Uh, in other words, he's overly logical and uh, not very empathic, we'll say. So dealing with Asperger's and high-functioning autism in your spouse can be very difficult. You know, Asperger's men who present themselves as Mr. Logical tend to be afraid of being controlled by others and losing who they are inside of a relationship. In some cases, they may reject emotional attachment as a way of protecting themselves. Now, in many cases, Mr. Logical has trust issues that come from things that happened to him in the past. For example, you know, some of these men may have developed a tough and distant exterior due to being bullied throughout childhood because they had this kind of nerd-like behavior. They were kind of odd or quirky and they got uh, ostracized from their peer group. So if you're trying to get Mr. Logical to feel comfortable talking to you, you want to avoid starting conversations with sentences like, we really need to talk, or this is important. These kinds of lead-ins will definitely trigger a clam-up response. He might feel cornered or pressured by the serious tone of the conversation. You can expect Mr. Logical's emotions to be displayed as actions rather than words. 
The Asperger's man's emotions are confusing and sometimes contradict each other. Oftentimes they don't even understand their own emotions. Depression often goes undiagnosed because it's difficult for male Aspies to explain what they're feeling or that they feel ashamed for not subscribing to the society norm of a tough, well-adjusted, providing man. So as you may have discovered, your Asperger's husband often has difficulty communicating his feelings. He does not want to tell you that he is sad or depressed. So if you want to appeal to Mr. Logical's brain, then when attempting to problem solve with him, use rationality rather than emotionality. When you're talking to a logical man, it's vital to talk to him in a manner that he can comprehend. So to express yourself to this type of male brain, realize that he might not think in emotions in the same way that you do. The Asperger's brain operates in a more rational, non-emotional fashion instead. So as difficult as it may be for you, the neurotypical wife who has a very highly developed emotional brain and is highly socially skilled, if you utilize logic, he may find talking and opening up to you more comfortable. He may be more likely to listen to you, understand what you're saying, and cooperate with the changes that you are suggesting and hopefully live up to most of the expectations you have for the relationship. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and today I want to talk about some of the traits of Asperger's Syndrome that are pretty much hardwired and if you are, for example, a neurotypical wife in a relationship with an Asperger's husband, you do want to pick your battles carefully because some of the things that you may have viewed as selfish, uncaring, and insensitive may have been directly or indirectly related to some of the traits of the disorder and these things can't be changed much and they certainly can't be fixed or eliminated. It's possible that as much as 80% of the unwanted behavior that you have witnessed in your Asperger's husband was not intended to be hurtful. It wasn't malicious by design. I know that doesn't reduce your hurt, but it might help you take a few things less personally. Think of Asperger's as a disorder of insight into the thoughts and feelings of others. Let me repeat that. Asperger's can be viewed as a disorder of insight into the thoughts and feelings of others. Now this is also called mind blindness. So issues that revolve around mind blindness are those issues that you need to put into the I can't fix that category. You have a category in your mind, the I can't fix it category, and you put mind blindness issues into that category. In other words, you don't want to waste a lot of time or energy trying to fix that. Honestly, it would be a whole lot easier and a whole lot less painful to simply go beat your head against a brick wall than to try to fix mind blindness issues. Because of mind blindness, it may be very difficult to engage your Asperger's husband in the types of dialogue that marriage and family therapists use. These professionals may not have dealt much with partners affected by Asperger's, and honestly, they may need information from you in order to avoid misunderstandings. If the truth be known, it may be more useful for you to talk to a therapist on your own in order to have a chance to think through your feelings and decide what might be some effective coping techniques in dealing with an Asperger's partner. As an NT spouse, you have a highly developed social-emotional brain. You easily pick up on facial cues, body language, innuendos, sarcasm. You can kind of predict outcomes. Your Asperger's husband does not have those skills. He is a person who is a visual thinker in the verbal world. And with mind blindness, he doesn't pick up on how he feels, how other people feel. And if you speak to him in terms of feelings, for example, I feel this way about such and such, and you expect him to take how you feel and apply that to an action that he's supposed to take, it's never going to happen. So save yourself the grief and just bypass that whole scenario. Don't talk to him in terms of how you feel. Instead, talk to him in terms of what you need. Be concrete. Just tell him what you need. I need your help with blah, 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 blah. And you're going to fill in the blank with something. Just cut to the chase, okay? Because of mind blindness, he doesn't want things to change. He wants everything to stay the same. He doesn't like surprises. Structure is super important to him. So he's going to need plenty of notice up front when such disruptions are going to occur. 
Also, understand that all the unwritten rules of behavior are very confusing to your Asperger's husband. Something that you think is obvious is not going to be obvious to him. People with Asperger's syndrome may not be able to project their mind into a hypothetical situation or put themselves in someone else's shoes. They oftentimes do not recognize the needs of others, and it's not because they're purposely trying to be selfish or insensitive. Rather, it's that their social-emotional brain is underdeveloped. Asperger's syndrome is a developmental disorder. So when communicating with your Asperger spouse, don't be vague or assume your wishes will be acknowledged and understood. For example, it may not be enough to remind him that you're having family over for dinner. You may need to go through the entire evening in great detail. For example, I need you to help me with this, or I want you to greet everyone as they arrive, or I would really appreciate it if you didn't go to bed before the guests leave, and so on. So understand that in many cases, the Asperger's individual is simply not going to get better or be transformed into the husband that you thought you married. Even so, certain behavior can be modified or changed, which can make daily life less stressful for you. For example, establishing routines and agreeable timetables, looking at how you talk to him and what language is used. So it's not just a hopeless case here. There are things that can be done. If you're interested in a program that can teach you some of the things that can be done, there's a link below. Also, if you would be interested in couples counseling, either by yourself or with your spouse, There's a link below this video that will direct you toward that resource as well. Thanks, guys. Mark Hutton, adultaspergerschat.com. Hey, guys. This is Mark Hutton with adultaspergerschat.com. And um, I got a couple emails recently that made me want to have this little talk and that is it's usually from the NT spouse most often it's the NT wife and she will say you know I just long for the days back in the day when we first got together and we would talk for hours and everything was spontaneous and uh, and now we fast forward to today and we never talk I just wish we could just sit down and talk I hate to pop your bubbles please forgive me but talking is work to him I'm sorry you didn't want to hear that talking is work to him so then the question becomes okay what am I supposed to do then you need to find something to do together that remotely resembles play play remember that word p-l-a-y you used to do that back in the day that's the magic word for this little speech play p-l-a-y italicized, underlined, bold, font of 72, and color red. Write it down. Play. You've got to find something that is remotely recreational or somewhat uh, entertaining for him that you guys can do together. Because if you wait to have quality time uh, in the form of talk, you're going to be waiting a long time. That's not quality time to him. I know it's quality time to you. Uh, And there are some guys out there that like to talk. Mostly about their special interests, though. So, if you can find something, and I know that there's something out there that you could find that he would enjoy and you would find some enjoyment, you can do it together. Think in terms of play. Don't you dare comment under this video and say there's not one damn thing I could think of that even be remotely uh, enjoyable to him. I'm not going to buy it. There has to be something. He's not a freaking robot. Okay? So, the magic word for today is what? Play. You get it? Okay, well, if you get it, then do it. Because if you get it and don't do it, it doesn't cut it. So what are you waiting for? Go play. So now we want to look at why people on the autism spectrum tend to prefer their special activity to spend time and energy with that as opposed to spending time and energy with their special person. 
uh, which in this case would be their neurotypical spouse. So if I have autism spectrum disorder, by default, I have this thing called mind blindness. Simply put, it's hard for me to predict what might be in the mind of other individuals, what they might be thinking, and that creates a cascade of problems because now, if I don't understand how they think, I also don't understand uh, why they say and do the things they do. I don't understand their motives. I don't understand their perspectives. And so I'm lost in that regard. Also with ASD, if I am wired that way, I have alexithymia, which means that I have, in addition to mind blindness, I have emotions blindness. I don't understand how I feel. I don't understand how other people feel. Uh, I don't get the connection between their facial cues, body language, and how they're feeling. I don't get the connection between their tone, tone of voice, volume of voice, uh, wordage, and how that connects to their feelings. So there again, I'm lost. So being so out of touch with others in the social and emotional sense creates a lot of unpredictability in my life. I don't understand how I feel. I don't understand how you feel. I don't understand how you think, why you behave the way you do, why you say, say the things you do. I'm so out of the loop that I live 24-7, 365 days a year in some state of unpredictability. And this chronic low-grade unpredictability that manifests at home, in the workplace, and otherwise creates mild low-grade anxiety in me 24-7, 365 days a year. So living a life of chronic low-grade anxiety puts me in a position to want to reduce that anxiety. So I come up with a host of anxiety reduction strategies. That's going to be some version of a meltdown, mild to severe, and or some version of a shutdown, mild to severe, or I may engage in false agreement. In other words, I just give you the indication that I'm going along with what you want and what you're saying, just basically to get you to stop talking to me and end the conversation because it's getting too stressful. But one of the most important things that I do with this chronic low-grade anxiety due to so much unpredictability in my life is I create a lot of structure and routine. Since things are so unpredictable, I try to make them as predictable as I can, and that is through providing myself with a set of routines, a set of rules, a certain structure that I must abide by to keep my anxiety at bay. And one of the best ways that I can achieve this business of routine and structure is to find an activity that I enjoy and become totally hyper-focused and engrossed in that activity. Because now I have super predictability and I have super anxiety reduction when I am totally absorbed and mesmerized by and in my special interest. Whether that's my work or some hobby or some computer uh, game, you name it. There's a multitude of different things there. So this creates a problem for me socially because now the people that uh, supposedly want to connect with me have a great difficulty connecting with me because I'm gone. I'm spending more time and energy and more passion with my special interest than with my special person or my special people. And they feel left out, ignored, disrespected. They view me as being selfish, uncaring, insensitive, narcissistic, and even sociopathic. And they feel emotionally deprived she may even claim that she has Cassandra syndrome. All of this is not what I want, and it raises my anxiety even more, which makes me engage in my special activity even more, which creates more distance between me and my special person or my special people, and which makes me in turn want to spend more time with my special activity. So in summary, my spending a lot of quality time with my object of preference 
which is probably nothing to do with anything social, is my structure, my routine, my anxiety reduction strategy. So I have a chronic special interest to deal with my chronic anxiety. So if I have ASD, I'm going to have a lot of routine and structure, which means I'm going to have a lot of rules. I'm going to be the type of person that wants things to be done in a certain way at a certain time. I don't want my routine interrupted. I don't want to have to shift my focus from what I'm doing now to tending to somebody else's needs or wants or desires. So I'm going to be very rule oriented. I'm going to be super resistant to any kind of change, especially unexpected change. And when my routine gets interrupted, that's when my anxiety comes up. And that's when the significant people in my life are probably going to witness me doing some version of a meltdown or a shutdown. So in this way, a meltdown or a shutdown or a combination thereof is really nothing more than anxiety overload, which in turn means I'm going to soon go back to reducing that anxiety, which means I'm back to my special interest again. So in a nutshell, my special activity is always highly predictable, whereas my special person is most often highly unpredictable. Mark, I have a question and I'm okay with you adding my voice message and your answer to a public YouTube video. My question is as follows. Is there enough evidence to describe a specific pattern of deterioration of a marriage in which the woman is suffering from Asperger, uh, whether diagnosed or not, and typically not, and the male is a neurotypical? I'm specifically wondering whether the continuous masking of the Asperger woman and the need to take the mask off from time to time uh, in the most convenient place at home, as well as her, as her uh, frequent anxiety, uh, create a pattern in which the neurotypical man, who is typically unaware of the Asperger, uh, responds negatively to her lack of empathy and the feeling that he and or the kids come only second after her work or a special interest, which unavoidably creates um, create a distance between the couple and quite uh, paradoxically the Asperger woman blames the neurotypical man for being distant, small-minded and maybe oversensitive as a cause for all of their marriage problems. Uh, thank you very much in advance. Thanks. Okay, well thanks for the question. Uh, as far as evidence for a specific pattern that you described, uh, I don't know of any actual research that would contain all of those elements, but there's definitely a, a anecdotal evidence and reports that what you described, which is multifactorial by the way, um, definitely occurs in many ASD plus NT relationships. Uh, you mentioned masking and uh, especially doing the masking at home. And so what goes on there, especially with a uh, female on the autism spectrum, is uh, <clears throat> I don't necessarily use the term masking. I use the term mimicry. So if uh, we'll use your wife as the example, if she's at work, um, what typically happens is the ASD individual is not sure exactly how to act socially. And uh, from a very young age, they've learned how to copy the behavior of others. And so they get mimicry down to a science uh, that's what I guess you're referring to as masking. And so when you um, act as if you are typical all day long, that's exhausting. And it also involves a lot of, of uh, denying the self and faking being somebody else. Uh, constantly observing others, constantly on alert to, oh, did I say something wrong, or am I doing something wrong, or how should I behave in this meeting, or what do I need to say to that coworker? So that is very exhausting and anxiety-provoking. And so when she gets home at the end of a long day of doing that, um, she does need to decompress. And unfortunately, what happens when the ASD spouse, who mimics throughout the day, comes home, the NT spouse is often the target of anxiety reduction. Now, I do want to deviate from the question here just a little bit and make the distinction between mimicry and masking. Masking suggests that the individual is purposely trying to be deceitful and trying to hide something that is perhaps malicious, whereas mimicry suggests trying to fit in. Masking is deceitful, 
Mimicry is trying to fit in. Masking is trying to exclude something. Mimicry is trying to include something. So in this case, the ASD spouse feels very comfortable being her true self in front of the individual, the this, this significant other in her life. She feels very comfortable being her true self in front of him. And so tolerance is probably low. Need to decompress, isolate is probably very high. Um, any type of uh, sensory sensitivities or additional overload in the evening times with family will be met with some version of shutdown or meltdown. And then, of course, the NT spouse is going to respond defensively, which exacerbates the situation. It's also typical for the ASD spouse to have a special interest. And I think what you've described in your question is, in this case, the special interest is work. And it's not that she doesn't care about you or the kids, but she spends most of her energy with work and has very little left over. And it's not that she lacks empathy. It's that she doesn't display empathy in the way that is meaningful to perhaps you or the kids. It's also not uncommon for the occurrence of uh, the ASD spouse being somewhat non-empathic, we will say, and uh, being more absorbed in her special interest or work. And then the other family members feel like they're not important. They feel like the ASD spouse is being selfish, insensitive, uncaring, perhaps even narcissistic. And they may angrily and justifiably blame the ASD spouse for not really truly connecting and being present and showing validation, empathy, emotional reciprocity, and so on. But due to the ASD spouse's mind blindness and alexithymia and some executive function deficits, these pleas from the NT for connection download in the ASD brain as criticism. So what you've described is a sequence that contains certain elements that are quite common. It's more common in the role reversal situation where it's the ASD male and the NT female, but it certainly can occur in the way that you described. So the question then becomes, how can the NT spouse voice, in this case, his concerns about uh, a disconnection and a feeling like uh, comes second compared to work, how can he voice his concerns about that in a way that doesn't download his criticism in the ASD wife's brain? And uh, therein lies the dilemma. Uh, a communication strategy would need to take into account those two things. There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all communication strategy because each individual is different, each couple is different, and each way that they argue and try to problem-solve is different. Having said that, though, there is a link below this video. Uh, I do a couples group. We look at some very individualized methods to establish communication. And on another note, if you have a question, there's a link below this video that says, Ask Your Question. Click on that link, and uh, I would like to make you a part of the next YouTube video. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with adultaspergerschat.com and I got a bunch of questions here. Um, all of which are from neurotypical wives about their husband with autism spectrum disorder. And um, these are questions specifically from the NT ladies in my counseling groups. And I thought I would just address them all in one cluster here instead of uh, doing them individually. And so we'll run through here real, real quick. Um, the first one she asked is, autism spectrum disorder, does the diagnosis of that change anything? Um, well, the actual diagnosis doesn't change anything, no. It doesn't change who your husband is or what he can accomplish. Um, it does give him somewhat of a roadmap to the traits that he's likely to experience and some of the treat treatment strategies to address those traits. But uh, the diagnosis in and of itself doesn't change anything as long as the two of you know that you have communication breakdown and it causes a problem for both of you and you both want to fix it, then we don't necessarily need to label that anything other than uh, communication difficulties. And the next question is, does ASD level one get worse with age? 
And the answer to that is not likely. Most teens and adults with autism spectrum disorder have less severe symptoms and behaviors as they get older. And um, that's not to say that all adults on the spectrum get better, but the vast majority of them will. Um, some of them do get worse with age, but that is almost always the case with the individual who has just excessive amounts of anxiety and depression and then engages in so much destructive behavior to reduce his anxiety that uh, him, his symptoms do get worse over time. Uh, the next one, can you be slightly autistic? Um, yeah, there's uh, a spectrum, as you know, there's high functioning, moderate functioning, and low functioning, but even on the high end of the spectrum, which we call high functioning autism, right, there's another smaller spectrum so that would be like high, high functioning, high, moderate functioning, high, low functioning. So there are some people that are so high on the high functioning end of the spectrum that they literally pass under the radar. And as far as everybody else is concerned, they're neurotypical. And the next question is, what are some of the red flags that I need to be aware of that may indicate my husband has autism spectrum disorder as my suspicions lead me in the direction to believe that he does? Um, Basically, if he has difficulty interpreting what you think and feel, if he has trouble interpreting your facial expressions, body language, and any other social cues that you give off, and if he has difficulty regulating his emotions, in other words, you witness uh, shutdowns and or meltdowns, or we could also maybe call them adult temper tantrums, uh, low frustration tolerance, um, these things uh, would definitely indicate that uh, a diagnosis, if he wants to seek a diagnosis, might be appropriate. What triggers my husband with Asperger's syndrome meltdowns? What triggers his meltdowns? Uh, usually that has to do with sensory sensitivities, changes in routine, anxiety, communication difficulties that result in anxiety as well. So um, remember that people on the autism spectrum have this thing called mind blindness, which means they have a lot of unpredictability in their world, and so they try to make it as predictable as possible, and that comes through the use of a lot of routine and structure, and they don't like change as a result. And so when any changes to his routine come along, uh, that is a trigger for a meltdown. Um, but Really, the changes in routine is just another, is just one form of anxiety producing events. So the big picture here is anxiety is the main trigger for meltdowns. And there's different components that could be subsumed under anxiety. Those would be like sensory sensitivities, changes in routine, communication difficulties, and so on. Can a person with Asperger's feel love? Uh, well, I would hope that we wouldn't even have to answer that question. Your husband with, in this case, Asperger's, he's not an automaton or a hologram uh, or a robot, although I have some NT wives that say her husband does come off like Spock from Star Trek. But um, of, of course they feel love. They don't necessarily dis display their emotions much. So he would have empathy, but he may not have displayed empathy. And what I mean by that is he may not uh, behave in certain ways or say certain things that convey empathy to the level that you would want. But he certainly ha can feel love and can, cer can certainly express empathy. In fact, in some cases, believe it or not, the ASD individual is so empathic that he has found from a very early age that it's just too painful to feel that empathy. He, he feels too closely the pain of others, and that is so anxiety-provoking that he literally shuts his feelings off. And so there it does appear that he's not a very loving, caring, sensitive, empathic person. And the next NT wife asks, what are the main symptoms to look for? Uh, well, I touched on that earlier, but um, some of the main signs would be if uh, you're, in this case, husband, I assume, finds it hard to understand what you're thinking or feeling, if he tends to get very anxious about social situations, if he 
finds it hard to make friends and prefers to be by himself over there somewhere engaged in his special interest away from family. If he often seems blunt, rude, or not interested in others without meaning to, that would be a main sign. And if, it's, if he finds it hard to say how he feels and finds it hard to comprehend how you feel, those I think would be the main signs of autism spectrum disorder. Next, does ASD cause anxiety? Um, absolutely, 100%. I don't know anybody, uh, and I've been working in this field for a while, who has uh, Asperger's or high function autism that does not have anxiety. There's varying degrees. Some have really high anxiety, some have moderate. But um, if they have super low anxiety and they've been diagnosed with ASD, they've probably been misdiagnosed. And the last question I'll entertain today is, do the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome or high-functioning autism ever go away? Um, sometimes um, it's possible that the traits uh, outlive their lifetime, and so, uh, so to speak. So some of the traits that the individual may have exhibited as a teenager, for example, um, he's no longer exhibiting those. So research does, uh, in the past several years, has shown that children can outgrow a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Um, in other words, their symptomology has um, lessened or decreased so dramatically as they've grown into the teenage years and young adult years that if they were to go back and get retested, they actually would, would just fall right out, just outside of the zone of being on the autism spectrum. So, um, and a lot of that has to do with early intervention, making sure that the child uh, is taught social skills and gets all the other interventions that are needed at a very young age. So there's links below this video for more resources, and don't hesitate to email me if I can answer your question. Thank you. This is Mark Hutton, adultaspergerschat.com.